We end our series this morning on discipleship, and what I hope has emerged as a part of this series is that your followership of Jesus, your relationship with Jesus is not a personal matter. It is a personal matter on one level, but it is so much more than that. God has a mission to the entire world, and that mission has a church, and we are that church, and the church is called to be this outpost of the kingdom of God in a world that needs to know who God is. And for that to happen then, the church is going to have to model the character of God to the world. And if we are not where we need to be in following Christ and knowing Christ, who is the exact representation of the God we're called to represent, the farther we are from that Christ, the more difficult it is for the world to see who God is. God's mission has a church, and you're it. You're it. And we are called to model the character of God by the ways we live together and by the ways we reach out to the world around us. We are called to model God's justice, God's mercy, God's love and God's holiness together as the church. And so what we, what we want to see happen in our followership of Jesus is to become the kind of people who can display the power and the righteousness of God to the world around us. And when I say righteousness, I think I mentioned last week that righteousness is a relationship word uh, for God. It's not just that God does good things. I called it last week, I think, right relationshipness. We want to display God's power and God's right relationshipness to the world around us. And we're called to bring that grand news of God's desire to be in relationship with people. Uh, to, we're called to bring that news to the world. And so we're going to have to learn how to do that. We're going to have to learn how to be that right relationshipness. And the church is a place where we practice that justice, that mercy, that love, and that holiness of God that we're trying to share with the world. But here's the problem. Justice and mercy are opposite things on many levels. It is hard to be people of justice and people of mercy at the same time. I want to make sure this, this is apparent to us because that's going to come at a high cost. When people are forgiven for their sins, that's not justice. And so something has to, has, has to bring those two things together. As I was working on the Sermon on Forgiveness this week, what kept popping up in my news feed was, of course, the return to the stage of comedian Louis C.K. this past week. If you're not familiar with Louis C.K., he is a comedian who uh, was uh, part of the, part, one of the people who fell as a result of the Me Too movement. Uh, and he confessed that the things that were, he, that were said that he had done were things that he had done. And his confessions were um, uh, disturbing and more than a little perplexing even, uh, what kind of things had happened to cause him to become, I don't want to say a victim of the Me Too movement, um, because he's not a victim, is he? Um, whatever he was of the Me Too movement, about 10 months ago, he dropped out of sight because of what was brought out about things he had done. And then he just appeared on stage again this past week. And there was a lot of pushback in the media, people saying that they didn't think that he had done enough to merit forgiveness in order to come back and perform again. And I got to thinking about that because I, I think I would come down on the side of his critics there. But at the same time, I have to ask myself, how do you merit forgiveness? What could he do? Uh, what, would, what would help people say, okay, we forgive him. And by the way, was his, were his sins against us or against certain women who were mistreated by him and in his, in his employ? Um, he could give money to some causes, right? He could help the careers of some 
uh, young female comedians, help bring them along. Or there are all sorts of things he could do that might help that be better received, but he can't undo what he did. It can't be done. And anything that can't be undone means injustice. That's just how it is. Injustice and forgiveness, they, they, it's a scandal that we have to figure out how to deal with as we look at God's character and as we look at how we're going to display that character. And so, as I preach today on forgiveness, um, you, you kind of know this sermon. Uh, even if, you, even if this, this is the first time you've heard me preach, you've heard sermons on forgiveness. You know what I'm going to say. You need to forgive. That's, that's not going to be a surprise that will be in there. Um, <clears throat> of course, I will say that. I think you know that I would say that the reason we need to be disposed toward forgiveness is because of the great forgiveness God has given us that we don't merit. Uh, through Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven. Uh, I think you've got that. Uh, I want you to think of names now. Who, who do you need to forgive? Uh, it, those names are probably popping in your head right now. Could be a father, could be a mother, could be a spouse, could be an ex-spouse. It could be a sibling, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, former boyfriend, former girlfriend. Maybe it's a teacher in your past. Maybe it's a coach. Is it Lane Kiffin? Is it, um, that's just for the Tennessee fans. Maybe it's Urban Meyer. I see some Ohio State folks back there as well. Ohio State and Florida kind of have to get together on that. No. These, these are the people who can do, there's nothing they can do to merit your forgiveness. It's just not possible. And so you're left with just a few options. What are you going to do about it? I've noticed that, and, and I'm a little hesitant to share this, I've noticed that if I get bitten by a mosquito, um, if I kill that mosquito, it's still not enough. Have you experienced that? Like, uh, all it did was bite me, but I kill it and it's still not enough. I wish I could hold it. And dare I say, pull the wings off? <laughs> Make it scream as a warning to other mosquitoes and then kill it and it's still not enough for the offense it gave to me. I think that's what we have to remember about forgiveness. No matter how much you try to punish that person, no matter how much you undo them, it's still, it's not going to be enough. So we've got to find a different way forward. And today we look at the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to back up from the text you heard in Matthew 18, 15 there. It's a text that's been really important to me in the ministry. Um, the Gospel of Matthew, this, this text has a context. The, the Gospel of Matthew starts off with Jesus proclaiming the arrival of the kingdom of God. And that frames very much of what happens in all of the book of Matthew. This is God through his son establishing his kingdom on earth. That's, what the, that's what's going on in Jesus of Nazareth. And when we get to Matthew 18, we see that it starts off, and you, you're, I invite you to turn to Matthew 18 and look at it. It starts off. Uh, with this um, blessing of the children, with uh, you can't enter that kingdom of God that God is establishing unless you become like a child. And then it moves into the importance of not hurting a child, a text that is uh, a, a thousand percent as relevant today as it was back then. Jesus says uh, that... Um, uh, if you put a stumbling block in front of a child, if you hurt a child, that it would be better off for you not to exist than to do that. So this is, the, this is the flow of Matthew 18. You have to become like a child. Don't you dare hurt a child. That's the next part. And then it goes into this uh, parable about uh, the, the sheep, just, just a quick mention of the sheep where once you become a part of the flock, you have to go out and then find other sheep. I, I don't know if the, the flow of that logic, because uh, Matthew didn't put these together haphazardly. I don't know if the flow of that logic sticks closely to us, but let, let's think about why he would do that. 
you, you have to become like a child. Don't you dare hurt a child. And to be in this kingdom, you're in mission. All those, all those go together, I think, for Matthew there. Maybe that's why in John 10, 9, Jesus says, I'm the gate of salvation. And uh, whoever enters through that gate will be saved. But then he says, and you will go out and come in and find pasture. There is something about being in this kingdom, in this flock, that means you don't just get to rest in the fold. You don't just get to be comfortable in the church. Even when you have gone through that gate of salvation, you're still going to have to go out and come in and be a part of the mission of God because our discipleship is not about our own comfort and our own relationship with God. That's part of it, but it's about the mission. It's about the mission. So he goes from, uh, just to recap again real quick, got to become like a child. Don't you dare hurt a child. You're going to have to go out and uh, be a part of mission. And then he goes into this text that I chose for forgiveness today, Matthew 18, 15, and what comes after it. Uh, this, this text is about forgiveness, but it's about even more than that. It's about church discipline. Uh, that is something that is foreign to a lot of us as free church people. Uh, we're not used to even thinking that heavily about church discipline. In fact, we often hear that the church is, is uh, too uptight about things. Uh, I'm guessing if we look at the news now, we'll see that the church hasn't been uptight enough. We talked, we mentioned last week the Roman Catholic situation uh, with the priest. That is a failure of church discipline. It's a failure of Matthew 18, 15. It's a failure to follow it. And it's not just the Roman Catholic Church. It's happening in churches all over. This is an important matter, and we begin to see why when we think about the mission of the church. Because when all these safeguards fail, it completely undermines the church's ability to display the character of God to the world around us. It undermines mission completely. When you watch the news about what's going on with leadership of churches and see that they're caught in scandal after scandal, that undermines every bit of mission. So we are called in our followership of Jesus to practice these principles of addressing the sins in our brothers and sisters and allowing them to address our own sins as well. It's difficult. It's hard. So what we see in Matthew 18, 15 is that when you see a brother or a sister sinning or if they sin against you, you are called to go to that person first one-on-one. -on -one. Just go one-on-one -on -one and have a discussion. And if that takes care of everything, then you've won that person over. You're not just forgiven. You are reconciled for mission and it's all done and you're ready to move forward. That's a hard step, isn't it? That first one, I got to go to this person one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, what you find is it doesn't usually work very well. Sometimes it does. Uh, when, I was a, when I was a youth minister in my early, early days in ministry, there was a woman who, uh, well, there was a student who said, uh, this person, is she mad at you? And I, I said, I don't know, why? He said, she's saying some really bad things about you. And he told me what she said. So I thought, I guess I better go talk to her, you know. And I had someone praying for me when I went to talk to her. And I just said to her, uh, we'll just, we'll just uh, I'm trying to not use her name. It's good. Not that you, any of you know her. We'll just say her name is Sue. I said, Sue, I want you to know that if you've got a problem with me, I'm not made of glass. You can bring it to me. Um, you can talk to me about it. But I need you not to gossip about me. And she said, uh, oh, honey, I wasn't gossiping. I was talking loud enough for anybody to hear me. So, um, I didn't know what to do as a next step after that. Uh, uh. First, we take it to the person. That's a hard thing to do, but it sets in motion the ability to be reconciled instead of just papering over the differences and the problems and pretending they don't exist. 
because those problems will get worse. If that doesn't work, we're called to get some folks with us and to meet together in order to address the situation. That I have found is a little easier because you've already done that first step. So some of the, the stuff's kind of out in the open by that point. Now, it can be hard to still sit down and talk about it, but uh, the cat's out of the bag. So it's, it's a little bit easier. And if you win the person over there, then you're reconciled for mission. That's how it goes. What I often find is if you're not reconciled after that, is that person just goes away. So it's rare that you make it to the third step. Um, I, I've seen that very few times. But the third step is, if they still won't listen, it's time to come together as a body and uh, adjudicate it, and say what we think. All of those steps are not in order to be mean and judgmental to other people. They're all put in place so that we can be the mission of God on earth. It's, it's one of the things that makes it really hard yeah, because we usually just don't want to take that first step. And God has a sense of humor about this, I think, a little bit because even as I was writing the sermon this week at a coffee shop and that person that you're thinking about, I had my person in my head, like, uh, I've tried to reconcile, I've tried to reconcile, and it hasn't worked. And while I'm typing on the patio at Starbucks, he walked right by. <laughs> it's a hard thing to get done. You do those things in order to reconcile to each other for the sake of mission. Now, you can, you can rightly ask, um, what if it doesn't work? And I'll tell you right now, it often does not work. Um, often. But there's something that we need by going through this process that allows us to say we did what we could. We did what we could. As far as it depends upon you, live at peace with all people, we're told. Uh, we, this is years ago. I, I contacted this guy because I didn't want to use a story because it comes from here, but he's been gone uh, for over a decade. There was a young couple who moved here to go to school, and they had just gotten married. I remember the first time he, they, this couple uh, was, was in the sanctuary. They sat right about where you are, Bill. And I, I said hello to him. I met them. And he looked like he didn't want to be here at all. She looked like she was glad to be here. He, he had that thing about him that was like, I'm here, but leave me alone. So I left him alone. But they continued to come until she had to go uh, to France because she was studying French and she was part of an immersion program over there. And she went to France... And um, after a couple months, called him and said, I'm not coming back. And she had reconnected uh, with a, a boyfriend from her teens who was French. And they hadn't been married a year. And he came to my office to talk to me about it. Um, and at this point, he wanted to be here, I think. Um, things had changed a little bit. And one of the things he said as we tried to figure out what the best way forward was, one of the things he said that caught my attention was, um, I haven't been a bad husband. Uh, I don't deserve this. But even though I know there's more I could have done. And in that moment, I thought, I don't want you to be able to say that the rest of the way. I want you to be able to say, there wasn't more I could do. Yeah. So we thought about that for a little bit. And I said, can you can you fly to Paris and go tell her you want her back? And he said, I don't have the money and I don't speak French. And I said, uh, I understand, that's a tough one. Uh, his uncle gave him the money. He'd never been out of the country. And he flew to France with an address, got a cab, went to the address, knocked on her door. She didn't know he was coming, no answer. So he said he walked across the street to contemplate what to do next, and then he saw her walking up the street. And when she was putting the key in the door, he walked across and said hello. I still wish he'd been wearing a GoPro in that moment. <laughs> uh, he did everything he could, literally, to get her back. 
It didn't work. But now he goes forward in life knowing he did what he could. He went farther than other people would go in order to restore that relationship. That's what I want us to be able to say as the church because it's in that willingness to go farther than other people would imagine us going that we begin to feel the pain that God must have felt when he was reconciling us to him. See, this is discipleship training. When injustice and forgiveness come together, someone pays a painful price. We're called to pay that price because God did it for us on the cross. We're called to be that serious about the mission of God in the world today. For the church to be the light we're called to be, we have to practice that reconciliation and forgiveness and painful process here so that we can display the pain that God went through for the world. It's all part of our training. There's no way to be a church family without having some offenses committed by us and against us. It's gonna, forgiveness is necessary for a family to be a family, and we are called to practice that. And that's why it's Matthew, who in chapter five, way before the, our text today, talks about, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, about how if you come to give a sacrifice on the altar and you realize you have something against your brother or sister, you need to leave that sacrifice at the altar and go restore that relationship before you offer that sacrifice because that act of restoration is a more painful, more powerful act than the act of just offering a sacrifice. We tend to, we tend to make a, a table altar. Uh, that's not what Jesus is particularly talking about in the Sermon on the Mount at that point. But this has been the place where the church has traditionally said, before we come to this table, if if we've got anger and resentment toward other people who are coming around this table, we need to work it out. Not so that we will have a good relationship with God, all of that will matter, but so that God's mission can be fulfilled in the world. God has a mission and he needs a reconciled and loving family to display his character. Shall we pray?